Funding for NJ Spotlight News is provided by NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years, and Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. From NJPBS, this is NJ Spotlight News with Brianna Venozzi. Good evening and thanks for joining us this Friday night. I'm Raven Santana in for Brianna Venozzi. Concerns are growing among health experts. The U.S. won't be able to contain the monkeypox outbreak as a window of opportunity closes. The sole supplier of the vaccine is now saying it's unsure if it can meet demand and signed a contract with the U.S. manufacturer to make additional supply. But those doses won't be ready until December. The World Health Organization is raising alarms as well, saying cases have grown by 20% this week alone. In the U.S., there are just over 14,000 confirmed cases. Heading into the weekend, New Jersey is closing in on 400 cases statewide. But will the new actions by the White House be enough to contain the outbreak here? Senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan reports. It's a stopgap measure to stretch scarce vaccine supplies. By Monday, every one of New Jersey's 11 clinics administering monkeypox vaccinations will no longer give the regular one-shot per vial dose deep into the arm. The federal government's making 360,000 more vials of vaccine available, but to qualify, health officials say, Jersey must reduce each dose to just one-fifth the normal amount of vaccine. Garden State Equality's Chris Fuscarino's okay with that. We need to make sure that the vaccines are going to places that need it more than others, like New Jersey, who has yet to receive their fair share of monkeypox vaccines. And then if that also means um, lowering you know, the, the dosage so that more people can get shots in arms and that we can slow the spread, I think that's an important step. Clinics will need to get precisely five shots out of each vial. Also, they'll now give shots intradermally just under the skin. That's not easy, warns Montclair epidemiologist Stephanie Silvera. You're asking for perfection not only on getting that exact number of doses, but also to administer them perfectly as well. The CDC is under a tremendous amount of political and social pressure to provide something, right? So we were again caught on our heels. We knew this was coming. Um, we did not have sufficient amount of vaccines. 1.8 million doses is good, but doesn't get us necessarily to the number that we need to get in the arms of all of those who are potentially at risk, but still good a step in the right direction. Rutgers Dean Perry Halkita says using smaller doses does multiply vaccine availability, but critics are also concerned that the CDC's scientific basis for the switch is a very small study. It showed that while one-fifth intradermal doses of monkeypox vaccine worked, they were just 60% effective compared to 88% for the regular dose. Silvera says the CDC must make that crystal clear. Be open and honest about that, right? If we're, we cannot pretend that the intradermal dose is as effective as the subcutaneous because so far the data does not indicate that, but it's going to provide more people with access to the vaccine. New Jersey today reported 391 total cases of monkeypox. Access to shots remains problematic, particularly across racial lines. While whites account for some 25% of New Jersey cases, 41% of them got available vaccinations. Meanwhile, blacks and Hispanics make up 60% of cases, but got just 36% of vaccinations. There is definitely a disparity across race. And so if you're a white gay man, you're more likely to be vaccinated than a black gay man or a Latino gay man, right? People who had the means to travel further and wait in lines longer were able to get the vaccine. Silvera says transparency is one key to the CDC's regaining people's trust. The other is outreach. Anyone can get monkeypox, but it's more prevalent in gay and bisexual men. So the federal government's launching a pilot program committing 50,000 doses to pride events in the gay, bi, and queer community. Halkita says it's taking medicine to the people. Right, disrupting this notion that medicine only happens in hospitals, that care only happens in hospitals and 
I like that because what's going to probably happen with, is that it will get into the arms of folks who might not necessarily be able to get the vaccine because they're working or they don't have access. The monkeypox vaccine is currently two shots. And so we want to ensure that we're doing this in a smart way where folks are able to get their first dose of the vaccine and then we're able to identify those folks for their second dose. Meanwhile, with students headed back to college, sports and dorm life, public health experts urge people to be careful of sharing both towels and hugs. I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJ Spotlight News. A much needed economic boost is coming to the city of Patterson. Today, Governor Murphy joined Mayor Andre Sea and Congressman Bill Pasquale to announce over $54 million in new and expanded investments to the city. Of that, $3 million will go to improving emergency response vehicles, $1 million to renovating the Patterson Museum, and $5 million to social services like the Straight and Arrow program aimed at curbing the increasing violence among Patterson's youth. Also on the list, investments and communities near Patterson's Great Falls, electrifying city vehicles, and the much-anticipated redevelopment of the Hinchlift Stadium. Governor Murphy says this is all in an attempt to bring Patterson back to its once former glory. As well mentioned, Patterson is a wonderful, proud city distinguished so well by its history from the Great Falls to Hinchlift Stadium. But it is the people of Patterson who truly define it, hardworking people, proud people, people from all over the world who have come to this little part of New Jersey to help write our continuing American story. So much of New Jersey's historic economic power was generated right here in Patterson. I am proud now to provide these investments to ensure we continue to grow and evolve and succeed together. The bipartisan infrastructure bill signed by Joe Biden last year included $15 million to remove lead service lines. But a new report finds that Jersey will receive the second lowest amount of money per lead pipe in the nation included in the first round of funding. According to the Natural Resources Defense Council environmental group that published the report, New Jersey has an estimated 350,000 lead service lines and is getting just over $48 million. That averages out to $138 per pipe, second lowest to Ohio at $109. The discovery has led some of New Jersey's congressional delegation to urge the Biden administration to change the allocation formula and in a letter to the EPA calling the funding an absurd disparity and unacceptable. A newly formed large sandbar is threatening marine traffic in the Manasquan Inlet. Shifting sands have created a brand new sandbar which almost looks like a beach during low tide on the Point Pleasant side of the inlet. It's causing reduced water depth in other areas and creating dangerous conditions for boaters. And now some fishing boat captains fear the widening sandbar could create navigational issues. Ted Goldberg is in Manasquan where the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers met today to determine whether dredging is necessary. When David Goldman sails out, Hold on guys, we got inlet rocks. He's worried about finding fish and keeping his passengers safe through Manasquan Inlet. And we leave at all hours of the night in the morning to get the early bite and it, and then there could be fog sometimes, so we're getting pinched and pinched closer and closer and it's an inlet. It should be deep. There should be room for two boats to go back and forth. The water's not as deep as he would like thanks to large shoals that are hard to see with the naked eye. It's almost a guarantee an accident waiting to happen. On Goldman's radar, it's easier to see the shoals, which continue to grow every day unless they get dredged. During low tide, they form a dangerously large sandbar. Something's going to happen as that south side shoals up more and more and more. You can see it in the daylight on a low tide, but when the tide's coming in a little bit, the shoal's still there but now it's hidden. Goldman wants someone to dredge the inlet and neutralize the shoals before someone gets hurt. I use my radar, my, my electronics to make sure that there's not a vessel that is gonna be in my path either way, but a lot of people don't know and a lot of people fly through that inlet and you don't have that much time or any time to make a split second decision, otherwise you're, you're crashed in one jetty or on a boat. So yeah, and it's only gonna get worse because shoals don't form and then Unform. It's just going to keep growing and building and building and building and spreading across. He hopes the Coast Guard and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers surveying here agree with him. 
and we'll dredge the area. Get that boat here and let's get this done. So they're seeing the shoaling at low tide and they're seeing uh, that people are going down there, but there's also a problem that potentially stretches across the entire mouth of the inlet. The Corps was telling us that some of the sand that there that is there now was on the other side in uh, previous surveys that they did. Congressman Chris Smith and Point Pleasant Beach Mayor Paul Kanitra met with the Corps earlier today to discuss their recent survey of Manasquan Inlet emphasizing the dire need to dredge the inlet and its canals. From Point Pleasant Beach's standpoint, uh, our commercial and our recreational fishing is the lifeblood of this community. We're hoping that, you know, depending on their judgment, they'll make that judgment hopefully very soon uh, and, and issue that so that, you know, there's, it's more safe. Even if the Coast Guard and the Corps agree to this project, it's only a temporary fix. Our whole state is on the water and a lot of the Northeast, right? We're all on the water, so they should maybe allocate some funding to a couple more dredge uh, vessels so they could be permanently fixed in our shores and our inlets so people will be safe and hazards can be uh, prevented. While the Army Corps hasn't committed to dredging the waterway just yet, they have committed to future surveys to see if the situation gets worse. If it does, and the Army Corps does agree to dredge this waterway, it would be welcome news for people who use these waters, like Captain Goldman. In Point Pleasant Beach, I'm Ted Goldberg, NJ Spotlight News. Jersey's highways continue to be increasingly dangerous after new data recorded a 14-year high in traffic fatalities last year. And it appears the trend is continuing. Preliminary data for 2022 shows fatalities have increased 13.7% from January to March compared with the same period a year ago, according to the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration's report released this week. So why the increase? Well, according to some experts, motorists who took advantage of empty highways during the pandemic and exceeded the speed limit have not slowed down as more cars return to the highways. Overall, the agency says the numbers are moving in the wrong direction and cited other contributing factors to the increase, including failure to wear seatbelts and driving while under the influence of alcohol or drugs. In our Spotlight on Business report tonight, if you are looking to buy a home, this might be a good time to purchase one. New data shows that the competition to buy a home is starting to ease. Homes in July so far have received an average of 2.8 offers, down from 3.4 offers in June and down from 4.5 a year ago. That's according to the National Association of Realtors that also saw sales of previously owned homes fall nearly 6% in July compared with June. And now some experts say we are in a housing recession. So what does this mean for buyers and sellers here in the state? President of New Jersey Realtors Rob White joins me to break it all down. So Rob, are we in a housing recession? No, no, we're not. The market's still very, very strong. Um, while the numbers aren't performing the way they did in 2021 um, because of inflation and rising interest rates um, and lack of inventory. We're still very strong. Houses are moving quickly. Um, they're still selling above asking price. There are still multiple offers on the table. And while the interest rates have risen, our first time home buyers are still out there. So let's talk about home prices. They okay. have risen dramatically over the last two years, but will these prices continue to climb or are they leveling out? I think, you know, I think you're going to see a shift in the market. And so you are going to see some price adjustments or price improvements um, throughout the remainder of this year. Uh, you know, when you look at different towns across the state, you'll see that there there's quite a bit of inventory and uh, that inventory that's sitting anywhere from 30 days and beyond just means that they're probably priced too high. They were they were kind of reaching for the stars and didn't happen. So they're either going to get price adjusted or they're just going to come off the market. You know, Rob, for eager home buyers who are listening now, is competition to buy a home starting to ease at all? Yeah, a little bit, right? So you know, first part of the year, and of course throughout 2021, um, you saw first you saw all buyers, you know, going up against 20, 30 different people, you know, bidding on that house. Right. Now today, maybe it's seven to ten, so they do stand a better chance of a winning bid, um, depending on the terms. 
So is it a good time to buy or sell? It's always a great time to buy and to sell. Um, even with the rising interest rates, um, it's still a great time because real estate is still your best investment on the long term, right? Most, most home buyers are in their home anywhere from seven to 10 years before they move on to the next place. Many are in there much longer. So during that time, they're going to reap the um, benefit of you know, that asset in increasing in value over that period of time. And what impact, Rob, does this have in terms of mortgage rates? So, you know, from a mortgage perspective, I mean, we've seen rates as high as, you know, 6% this year. Um, they have they have dropped and uh, right now hovering somewhere around, you know, 4.875 to 5%. And so, again, that mortgage money is still cheap. You know what I mean? Even if you go back to, you know, 2017, 2018, we were, you know, we were in that four and a half to 5% uh, rate margin. So uh, the mortgage money is still very cheap. And that's why we didn't see first time home buyers, you know, stopping or, you know, running because the rates came up. They just basically adjusted um, their wants and needs list and maybe looked at areas in the state where the cost of living was just a little bit less. Taxes were a little bit less. So we are not in a housing recession, and it is always a good time to buy. You heard it from Rob here first. Thank you so much for joining us and giving our viewers so much great information. Thanks. Have a great weekend, you guys. Turning now to Wall Street, here's how the markets closed for the week. August 15th marked one year since the United States officially pulled out of Afghanistan and the Taliban took hold of Afghanistan, forcing more than 75,000 Afghans to flee their country. More than 13,000 of them were temporarily housed at a military base in South Jersey during Operation Allies Welcome, and a few hundred eventually resettled here in New Jersey. Melissa Rose Cooper speaks with an Afghan family who is now living here in the state about adjusting to life in their new community and what they think is happening back home. I miss Afghanistan very much. That's my, that's my homeland. Saeed Kabir Kamal fighting to hold back tears as he thinks about his beloved Afghanistan. Kamal and his family fled the country just over a year ago when the United States officially pulled out and Taliban took control. Afghanistan, where that I burned, my friends, my families. Uh, when I, I talk with them anytime, I, I cannot stop my crying, I cannot stop my eyes tears. A popular singer back home, Kamal used his platform to speak out against the Taliban, making him a target. I was telling them that you are going to wrong way. This is not the right path. Please do not kill innocent people. Do not uh, kill uh, innocent women. Pay attention to women's rights. Pay attention to human rights, child rights. Kamal turned to the U.S. for help, and now he, along with his wife and two children, call New Jersey home. Kamal even securing a job with the pharmaceutical company Pfizer. I'm very happy uh, now. Uh, I'm free and pe I'm living in peaceful area, peaceful country. More than 13,000 Afghan evacuees were temporarily housed at McGuire Air Force Base through a rescue mission known as Operation Allies Welcome. Hundreds of them resettling here in New Jersey. Afghan Girls Financial Assistance Fund is just one of the organizations working to help Afghans build a new life. For those who leave the country and come to the United States, we will help them if they need help in getting to the United States. So some we've helped are in Pakistan. They escaped the Taliban, went to Pakistan, Iran, and we help them through the visa process. We help find a school for them. We arrange for their travel for a host family so they can leave their home environment and be successful here in the United States. The group also assists with helping Afghans who fled enroll in school, especially women and girls. There has been a radical change in the opportunity for education of women and girls. That said, 
the desire for education that those women and girls feel has not been thwarted, even though they can't go officially to school in many cases, and they're living in a repressive regime, they are still very anxious to get an education. One less worry for Kamal, whose daughter is entering kindergarten this year and has dreams of being a pilot. Yeah, she told me that um, my grandmother and my uncles and my all friends are still in Afghanistan. I want to bring them out from Afghanistan. Uh, I cried, I cried because his, her little heart and little thinking is only uh, trying to save humanity. She is five years old, but she's thinking to save humanity. And even though Kamal is thousands of miles away from his native land and many of his loved ones, he always keeps Afghanistan near to his heart, never giving up hope that he'll see his homeland again one day. For NJ Spotlight News, I'm Melissa Rose Cooper. Before we leave you tonight, we want to tell you about an NJ Spotlight News special, Her Story, with senior correspondent Joanna Gagas, putting a spotlight on the many sides of issues affecting New Jersey's women. Anchor Brianna Venozzi sat with Joanna to talk about the first episode. Joanna, first of all, congratulations on the series. Uh, I speak for all of us when I say that. You dive into some pretty dicey topics. What can we expect in this series premiere? Yeah, thank you, Brie. Um, it's called Her Story, and I think that was really the point. As we look at what's happening in the world today, there was really no shortage of, of stories of things happening in the news today that impact women. And we wanted to hear not just from the policymakers, which I think we cover, you know, quite a bit on the news side, we wanted to hear from women. We wanted to hear from the people who are most impacted by things like the overturning of Roe v. Wade. And I think that was probably the most significant thing that, that happened that we wanted to know, how is this impacting New Jersey women? And so in this first episode of Her Story, I actually sat down with two women who shared really personal perspectives about their considering and choosing or not, whether or not to have an abortion. Take a look. How did you come to that decision? I came to it almost immediately. Um, I really wanted to go to a university. That was my goal. And I knew that if I was pregnant, I was going to not, I was going to have to give that up because I was going to have to raise the child. And I was also going to be stuck in that relationship. And I couldn't, I couldn't do that. I couldn't do it to myself. I still knew that, you know, I couldn't do it. So I made the decision the, actually the minute that I got that positive pregnancy test. How old were you when you were first pregnant? I was 23. Did you feel ready to be a mom at that time? No, I did not. Looking back, have you ever had any regrets about no. moving forward with the pregnancy? No. Describe your family life now. Now I'm married and I did not marry the father of the child. Um, we had actually split up when I was three months pregnant. Um, and I was a single mom for about six years, and I met my now husband, and I have another son now, Paul, he's four, and Justin is going into middle school. He's going to be a teenager on his next birthday. Wow, I mean, it's really powerful stuff, and of course, these were tough conversations to have that need to be had, yes? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that this is one of those topics in particular where people don't talk about it. It still is very much in the shadows. Um, it's not something that other than activists, most people are comfortable sitting around the dining room table and having a conversation about. Um, but speaking of activists, we certainly have people both pro-abortion and anti-abortion um, here in New Jersey. And we wanted to hear those voices as well. Who's celebrating, who's you know dismayed at this recent Supreme Court decision so we talked to some of those folks as well. Take a look. It just it was a, a gut punch. And knowing what we had gone through, I mean, I was there pre Roe v. Wade, so before the 50 year ruling happened. And I know what it was like for people who could not get a safe abortion. And I know how we fought for women's rights, for reproductive rights. And to see that just be taken away with like a stroke of a pen by a Supreme Court that really does not get it, does not get the will of the people, which I've always felt should prevail. And most people in this country 
supported Roe v. Wade and still do. You've been an activist for quite a while. Um, in fact, you were in front of the U.S. Supreme Court when the Dobbs decision came through overturning Roe. What were you feeling in that moment? I was just absolutely elated. I was so excited. I think that for so long we weren't sure whether Roe was actually going to be reversed. I always kind of really hoped and felt like it was going to, but so many people, even in the pro-life movement, they said, oh, it's never going to happen. But to see it actually coming to fruition, it was such an amazing historic moment. So this is, of course, um, a really serious and prominent topic. Uh, Joe. what can we expect from the rest of her story? We are going to delve into as many issues as possible that affect women. Um, episode two is going to look at women in the workplace and some of the challenges that arise that, that women kind of uniquely face that maybe their male counterparts don't. Uh, and then the sky's the limit because there really is no shortage of issues and topics uh, that affect the women here in New Jersey. All right, we can't wait to watch. Joanna Gagas, thank you. Thank you, Bree. You can catch the series premiere Saturday, August 20th at 6 p.m. and Sunday, August 27th at 10 a.m. on NJPBS. And that does it for us this evening. I'm Raven Santana for the entire NJ Spotlight News team. Thanks for being with us. Have a great weekend, and we'll see you right back here on Monday. The members of the New Jersey Education Association making public schools great for every child. RWJ Barnabas Health, let's be healthy together. And Orsted, committed to the creation of a new long-term, sustainable, clean energy future for New Jersey.